a uh, very good afternoon to everyone present here i spurti shetty research assistant at manipal health literacy unit prasanna school of public A very good afternoon to everyone present here. I, Spurti Shetty, research assistant at Manipal Health Literacy Unit, Prasanna School of Public Health, Mahe, Manipal, India. It is my honor to welcome all the participants from 22 different countries to get benefited from the second webinar organized by Manipal Health Literacy Unit, known as MHLU, in collaboration with Asian Health Literacy Association, known as ALA. MHLU aims to excel in health literacy resources, policies, and practices. The ALA seeks to understand health levels across Asia from a research initiating webinar series on health literacy for healthcare providers, researchers, policymakers, industry, academia, and public. Before I invite, invite first speaker of the webinar, I have some important requests to the participants. Small request to the distinguished participants to kindly mute your cell phone and the mic. You may post any queries question during the session through the chat box. We would be addressing few selected questions considering the time limitations. Today's webinar, we will be hearing insights on, of experts on health literacy on public health and enhancing health literacy through technology. Please note the speakers will be sharing the insights for 15 minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, the time has come now. I'm honored to introduce our first speaker of today's webinar, Professor Dr. Helmut Pran, founding director of Prasanna School of Public Health and the person who is behind or originating and spreading the health literacy throughout the globe, who has worked immensely on health literacy. Professor Helmut Brandt is a Jean Monnet Professor of European Public Health and a Head of Department of International Health at Maastricht University, the Netherlands. He studied medicine in Düsseldorf and Zurich. He holds a Master in Community Medicine from London School of Economics. Professor Brandt is a specialist in public health medicine. He holds an honorable doctorate from Sofia Medi Medical University. He was Director of Public Health Institute of North Rhine Westphalia, Germany. He is a past president of Association of School of Public Health in European Region and a past president of the European Health Forum Forum Castle. As a policy advisor, he serves on the European Advisory Committee on Health Research of WHO Europe and served on the expert panel on investing in health for the European Commission. At Mahi, India, he acts as a founding director of the Prasanna School of Public Health. I would like to request Professor Dr. Helmut Brandt to share an insight on health literacy for public health. Over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you very much for this uh, nice introduction. Now I start my timer for 50 minutes that I have to share with you. And um, I would like to confuse you a little bit, provoke you a little bit, so we have a nice discussion uh, ongoing later uh, when there is still this time. Um, I would like to guide you through the different stages of health literacy that we had the last 15 years, because I see at the moment we have a general, generational change in health literary research. A new generation of researchers is coming up. That's great. And for, for them, it's uh, important to understand uh, how to integrate uh, the new technologies Good into health. Morning. So uh, anything wrong at the moment or working? I'm audible, I, all fine? Yes, all, all okay. working. No, sure. um, when you look at the number of publications in PubMed regarding health literacy over the last 15 years, uh, there was in the beginning one or maybe two per week. Uh, now there are 10 to 15 a week. So we saw a real rise in the interest and in the outcome of health literacy research and concrete work. A recent bibliographic analysis of all the articles dealing with health literacy showed that there are several clusters in the world. Uh, 
one from Australia, one from Europe, uh, United States, Asia, Israel. Uh, but on the other hand, it's still a small core community. So welcome to the club. It's uh, not a big number of people who really are committed to the work and research and health literacy. So you can make a career in this. Let's go through different stages health literacy made. Phase one was patient health literacy. It was about patient education. How to understand what the doctor is saying to you. How to understand medical prescriptions. It's still important as new generations of patients are coming up and uh, because of our aging and uh, we change from citizen to uh, patient. So it's not outdated, but it was, let's say, the first step of health literacy. The second step and the phase two added to this was citizen health literacy. The question was, what kind of decision regarding health and disease and treatment I can hand over to the citizen while they are not diseased for preventive, medicine, uh, preventive measures, etc. And so it was about estimating the health competence of a healthy population. And that was the start of health literacy surveys in different countries. And the results were very interesting. Uh, they were integrated in national plans because in some countries health literacy of the normal population was low. Some of them integrated in the list of the high health targets that those countries wanted to achieve. And some countries even wrote national health liter literacy action plans. So you can see by describing um, uh, the health of the population, you can achieve a lot already. And now we're coming to phase three already, <clears throat> that is organizational health literacy. The institutions itself that deal with health and disease began to be interested in health literacy. And so they said, okay, we have to contribute too and have to be health literacy friendly. How to find your way in a hospital or how to understand all, all the offers that we have. How institutions that offer preventive services can explain what they are doing. So this was something uh, what was phase three, and there are now even since some years some awards for best practice examples. Phase four now uh, is recent. It's COVID. Um, in the beginning, I have to admit, I thought COVID would be absolutely no problem for health literacy. Because wearing a mask, okay, understandable to avoid infection, to keep a little bit of distance, okay, manageable, to wash your hands regularly, oh, we should do this anyhow. So I thought it would be not a big deal for health literacy because we also called it non-pharmaceutical um, interventions. So no drugs involved, no side effect discussion. Okay, I understand I could not uh, got more wrong. Um, it was a big chance for health literacy. Did we take it up? I don't know the TV coverage in all of the countries in the world. The ones I watched were Europe and Asia. So looking there, it was more the hour of the virologist, not of the public health people. People understand decision making under risk that politicians have to act without knowing everything, but they get confused when too many self-declared experts join the discussion. And that was something new to health literacy, that suddenly TV stations in a discussion not only had, let's call them established experts, but to, um, uh, have to show the virality of uh, arguments, uh, always there was one of those self-declared uh, experts who was always opposing. So by this, it added to the confusion and we really had a problem that health literacy measures in the classical way did not come through. Because what did we do until now? We had leaflets, information talks, perhaps a little video, but with the new era of social media, 
at that time, health literacy was not very well uh, established. Of course, the fake news problem is not a health literacy problem alone. It's a general one. So please don't try to solve this for health literacy. We have to solve this problem in general, otherwise we run into trouble. The social media rise also had it as an effect that the health professionals lost their information monopoly. Health professionals lost their information uh, uh, monopoly. Others are now uh, saying what is on the agenda and they spread the news. So we have to adopt to this. When we had all these publications on pre-publication servers, I looked at those who deal with uh, health literacy and in a way, most of them were not very helpful. Health literacy was just too slow. There were some opinion polls and so on. So citizen health literacy was measured, but there were no interventions really uh, uh, there that could have been evaluated. Yes, I understand you need time for this. And now we analyze backwards. Yes, we look what happened and we, we do our analysis and we publish. Um, but when you look at all this, health literacy publications uh, describe more what happened. And uh, it did not develop any real solutions in the last 10 years. So coming up for phase number five, digital health literacy. The underlying problem of this is digital literacy, not so much digital health literacy. Why? Because dealing with digital, the world of digital is the problem. And digital health is just one of the several applications. Of course, you can use digital solutions for our phases one to four, no problem. Instead of leaflets, you do it online. Instead of publications, you have an app. Of course, you then have the fallacy that you try to transform 100% what is in the analog world to the digital uh, world. We will not do this. We will see what kind of new possibilities there are uh, to have interventions that are digitally based. But in general, nothing major changes on content, just the way to provide. At the moment, there are too many survey tools already regarding digital health literacy. I counted five to seven, depending on how you define. That is not helpful in the international uh, work on health literacy. And on the other hand, this is already a moving target. We move from digital to artificial intelligence. You can say, oh, that's just another thing. No, it's not. Uh, now, being having availability of all the information of the internet, we could train the really fast going computers now to digest all this knowledge. That was a problem uh, 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 before. The availability of training material and the speed of computers, that is now there. They are stupid but fast. Those computers now can help us. So we have to have this in mind for the upcoming discussions. And, and in a way, you um, say, OK, they are only to 80% correct. Yes, it's like in the marketing. Uh, only 50% of the advertisements you pay for have an impact. But the problem is you don't know which 50%. So the same is true for the normal citizen. If uh, AI um, answer to your question is 80% correct, it is not marked where the incorrect 20% are. You have to know this. So access to information change to I have to read something to I can ask. But how to uh, secure the quality of this that the answer is correct? State regulations. This text has been produced by AI as a label or like in food we use label. Does it work? No, I think it's a it's a big challenge for regulatory science. What I think is we have to go back to strengthen common sense. Common sense of the people. I call it the April Fool effect. You know that in some countries on 1st of April, you 
you uh, play tricks on each other or you publish some news that are nonsense. But they are now getting so advanced that sometimes it's hard to find out is this now an April Fool joke or not. But this is the best training to find out is AI right or not. So I'm not saying AI is an April Fool, but uh, I think we should concentrate much more on common sense. So there will be no health literacy solution for this. It has to be a general uh, solution. So when you can spot the April Fool joke, then you are literate or competent. And I think that will be the, the job for the next generation of HLs, researchers, practitioners and lobbyists. If you do your career in health literacy, there's a tendency that automatically you try to roll out your topic to each and every new topic that is up upcoming. Please do not make the error to tell that age literacy is a solution to everything. It can help, but it cannot solve the problem alone. There is enough room for every researcher. And please, please work together in an interdisciplinary team, because that, I think, is the most important. And please, please, do not, need, do not add new surveys because of your career. Ah, I have to, uh, to uh, start a new survey by uh, taking an old one, adding uh, one question more, deleting one, and then I have my survey. Please don't do this, because what we really need is time series of surveys. And by creating a new survey, there will be no time series. You will not get the funding for uh, five or six surveys later. Please, please, please stick to this and don't avoid creating new uh, uh, survey tools. Second issue, please provide solutions. We have enough problem descriptions. 80% of all the literature is about we have a problem. We would like to see much more solutions. We need interventions that have been evaluated and have shown to improve the HL status, the health literary status of a population. So if you work on this, then you will have a bright future because everyone is looking for solutions. And uh, we know they have to adopt in cultural settings, uh, big and small cities, whatever, languages. But if we work on solutions, that's much more helpful than adding now again to the problem. We know that the problem is there. One last point to raise. The, um, it's about renaming health literacy to health competences. Already in some translations of the English term health literacy to some other languages, it's translated into health competences. I understand from English language health literacy means what we mean by health literacy, but there are uh, a lot of countries that have English as a second language and uh, uh, don't share this common um, history in uh, language terms. And I understand that um, in the US, there is US Healthy People 2030, where the term health literacy was enshrined. So the US colleagues have to use it to get funding. But I would really suggest, let us discuss if we move from health literacy to whole health competences, because it describes much better the problem and the solutions that we have. By this, I hope to have given you an overview about the different stages and phases of health literacy and how we can integrate the new technologies in this. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Band, for your enlightening talk. It is new learning for me too. Thank you for adding the knowledge. So let me introduce our second speaker of today's webinar, Professor Angela Y. Y. M. Liu. She's a professor and an associate head of School of Nursing, Polytechnic University, Hong Kong, China. She's a president of the Asian Health Literacy Association. She's an active researcher in health literacy and dementia caregiving with a wide range of publication and in international journals. She has a strong belief that the technology can help people to understand their current health status and make the informed health decision. 
being dedicated to the community based health promotion initiatives she provides consultancy services and advises to singapore cambodia and china for the implementation of who i cook model ma'am we are honored to have you here over to you um thank you thank you thank you for your kind introduction let me share the screen Can you can you see my screen right now? Yeah. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um. Thank you for the kind introduction. And uh, in the next fifteen minutes, I would like to share some of the work that I've been doing. Uh, in particular, how we enhance health literacy through technology. Uh, as mentioned, I've been working on health literacy for some years already, and I can see that uh, some of the achievements, but also some of the challenges that we have when we try to promote health literacy in the community. And uh, the, the good partner that I have is the technology. Okay, let's look at um, what do we mean by health literacy? I think that many of you, when you are working in this area, you probably are familiar with the definition from the United States. Uh, Department of Health and uh, Human Services that they mentioned that health literacy is the degree to which uh, we can obtain the health information and through that and we can also communicate with others. Um, we also look at how this being processed in our mind and uh, we can understand this information. At the end of the day, with all this information that we received it, we would like to make some appropriate uh, health decisions. So with that in mind, I think that is very important because day to day we actually have to make some decisions in relation to our health. It's not just at the moment when we are in front of the doctors or nurses, but uh, health decisions have to be made uh, for our own health every day. Um, Nupin, uh, Professor Laban from Sydney U and WHO also mentioned that, well, this is not the issue for individuals. Uh, of course, um, individuals can do a lot of things, uh, but then when we talk about health, it's all, uh, it's all related to our family members as well as the whole communities. So they remind us that health literacy can be broadly talking about um, the issues related to individuals as well as family members and communities. But at the end of the day, we would like to see that we are maintaining good health. Um, well, if a person or if the whole population has inadequate health literacy, and that would be a great concern in the public health. So that's why um, we need some body or something to help us. I think technology uh, is one of the way to help us. We use it day by day, and at the same time, uh, through this technology, we can receive a lot of information, including health information. So here, I try to give you three examples. Uh, that I try to use technology to help people to understand about uh, health issues and support them to make the health decision at the end. Uh, the first one is related to diabetes. Uh, I'm not talking about uh, those people who have already got diagnosed, uh, but those people uh, who may be at the risk of diabetes or they are pre-diabetes or they have diabetes, but they don't know, they were not diagnosed. It. So we use an app to help them. Um, the second project is about uh, using a, a mobile app to support a person to look at uh, their mental health well-being uh, that would use a painting strategy to do that. Um, the last one would be uh, we concern about those caregivers. They have been highly stressed during uh, the caregiving uh, procedures. So that's why we try to use a mobile app again to help them to alleviate the stress. So I would see that mobile app is very useful in a way that that can be applied in the community and reach out many people at one time uh, so that they can be used for health screening. As I mentioned, that they can be used for uh, uh, looking at pre-diabetes situations uh, without asking people to go to the clinics uh, and they can be the, the app can be used for health promotion. Uh, the good thing about this app is that it can be used at any time, so it can be used for self-assessment. When we talk about self-assessment, we, we, it can be extended to many parts, but here I just give you as an example that individuals can self-assess their mood and express their emotion. Um, 
lastly, uh, of course, the technology can help to connect with people and in support the individuals to make decisions uh, through social support and communication. So let's talk about the first uh, intervention here is that the uh, it was actually developed in 20, uh, 2015, 2016. At that time, when I talk about pre-diabetes, everybody say, no, 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 you are not going to talk about pre-diabetes. We have so many diabetic patients already. So why do you want to know who is in the pre-diabetes situation? So, well, uh, with that <laughs> a kind of uh, objective uh, objection, uh, but I, I, I still insist that uh, I think the community should know about by themselves that uh, whether they are at the good stage, uh, good health situation. So that's why I insist to make up this app. Uh, the app is good in a way that we do not need to ask the individuals to go to the clinics to take the blood test. Uh, they just use uh, this app answer nine questions so that they can get a score. And that score actually gives them an estimation that whether they are at the risk of diabetes or not. If then they are known to have that high risk, then they could make the decision to go to the clinics and, and take further investigations. Uh, so that's why I think the app is good in a way that is reach out people um, and allow them to make decision. Other than uh, assessing the, their risks, um, we also like to collect some information about their own lifestyle. So that's why you can see in the second uh, print screen, actually we are talking about uh, how, how, how active you are in physical activity. And the last screen is talking about whether you are taking, um, what, what kind of um, um, diets you are taking in morning and afternoon. So, after answering the nine items, uh, actually we are using the FINDRIS score uh, to um, ask these questions. And uh, once the person uh, answer the nine questions, then at the back end of the app, it can estimate uh, the risk score. And it will be shown like this uh, using a, a graphic to show that the blue, uh, the green one is uh, normal and the red one is about the high risk. So it's indicating to the users that actually they are in the normal situations or at the high risk of the having diabetes. So if uh, people know that they are at the high risk, then they will think about that, what should they do? Uh, as I mentioned, I asked them about their lifestyle, so that's why um, with the information from the users, we can sort of add, uh, understand that how good or how healthy their lifestyle are, and then we can give recommendations. So in the latter part of this app, actually, it is a given individualized uh, recommendations to the clients. Uh, this one is as, as an example here, is that it's asking the users to take three portions of um, vegetables and two portions of fruits a day. So it's a kind of recommendation according to the WHO. And uh, so they may not understand that how big the portion is. So another screen is to show them that, okay, if you talk about one portion of fruits, this give us some examples here. So the good things about this project is that um, we found that um, people actually like this app. Uh, we have um, put this up into Android, uh, Android Store and, and Apple Store as well so that people can download the app freely. And uh, it turns out that within a week, uh, uh, 13,000 people in Hong Kong actually download the apps. And we found that uh, they use it actually, uh, but of course some people would use it partially and then they just walk away. Um, Eventually, we have a uh, 4,500 cases that are so-called valid cases, and we do some analysis. Um, as, uh, as like the other scales, we, we have to calculate the cutoff point for uh, this uh, Fringe score. So that's why we, we use this uh, data set to calculate that. Uh, we find out that for the Chinese people, this Fringe score has to work out a new cutoff point. Uh, that means that um, we, we can recommend people to see that whether they are at the risk of diabetes or not when they are having a score 9 or above. And with that app, uh, we haven't stopped yet and we, we do a follow-up two years later. And we find that those people who are in, uh, in the high-risk group, actually uh, they have a higher chance to develop uh, diabetes in the future. Uh, but 
Do they do anything? Yes, they do. Um, according to the apps, actually, we give recommendations to them. We check out by calling them and see whether they actually follow these recommendations and change their lifestyles. We found that the high risk group actually improve their daily intake of vegetables and do more exercise than those who are at the lower risk. So we can say that uh, this app is good in a way that it is helping people to prom change their lifestyle and improve their uh, health behavior. So um, the app uh, now uh, is closed down, but just because that we we try to revamp a little bit by changing the uh, cut up pawn. Um, but in the future, I think that uh, this one would benefit more people. Um, the second project is about the e-painting mobile app. Uh, this one, uh, the reasons why we set up this intervention is just that we feel that a lot of people have mental health issues, but they are not aware of it. And at the same time, it's very challenging to uh, go to uh, those clinics. Uh, if they have a bad mood, they would not go out for that. So uh, we think about that and I, I, I easy instrument that can help them to self-assess them their own mood uh, and then tell them that whether they are in a good mood or not and at the same time they uh, that this app actually allow people to draw their electronic painting here and if they like they can share the pictures with other people and um you know art therapy is a way to express our emotion and some uh Articles actually say that once you have this kind of emotional expression, you have a better mental health as well. So with that concept in mind, uh, we build up this uh, e-painting mobile app and support people like that. And we try to group the people together so that they can have a small group uh, who know each other and then they can have a chat. If they have a very bad emotion, they can actually voice out or uh, um, try to seek help with, from the others. We also have a professional at the back end to uh, make an announcement talking about what kind of mental health services are being offered recently so that uh, people uh, who use this mobile app can actually go for uh, this kind of service um, if they like to do so. So um, the, the big question of this intervention is that whether people really like to draw the electronic painting, would that be too difficult for people to do that? And is that visible? Is that acceptable? So that is a big question to us. So that's why we conducted um, a visibility and accessibility study to check out that um, whether people really use this, uh, can really use this uh, e-painting platform. Um, the first phase is the development. I think the most challenging part is that um, we think of many, many possibility, uh, but the users would have another views. So that's why it is very important to involve the users uh, to, to, to in the, this development. Uh, so in this study, actually, I focus on the caregivers uh, who take care of the persons with dementia. So I invited um, 22 caregivers to come along and discuss about what kind of features that they would like to see in this e painting platform and what kind of fun features should be included. And uh, their comments are very useful. And then we work out um, uh, eight week intervention. That means the users can use this app for eight weeks and we want to see whether how good they are in these eight weeks. And um, do they have any further comments after using uh, the platform for eight weeks? So that's why we collect their comments through a qualitative study. And uh, actually this is very impressive that uh, more than half of the page of the clients, actually they would see that paintings uh, is very favorable to them. They really like these features. Although there is a features that let them people let the users to talk to others, uh, they would feel that that is good, but um, the painting parts, they actually like it. And at the same time, they feel that um, this app is very helpful in a way that, that they can feel that they, their pressure and their stress have, can be released. Um, we also ask them whether this, do they have any mood changes after using the app? They will, they actually, as some of them said, yes, they, they do have some feelings about the mood improvement. And they feel that um, uh, this 
uh, self-assessment features is also helpful because they can self-assess their mood at any time that they like. Uh, one suggestion made by the caregivers is that they would like to uh, have some background music while they are doing their own electronic painting. And they would like to see some colors that could be added to reflect their mood as well. So um, let's go and look at uh, what has happened uh, in the eight week intervention. We can see that um, one of the concern is that do they do do the do the users actually log in into uh, the platform and use it? So the answer is that yes. Um, we mentioned to them that actually they uh, they are recommended to use the app at least once a week uh, so that they can do their painting. 64% uh, of them actually follow this advice and um, about one third of the uh, one quarter of the people actually use more than require and uh, two clients, seven percent of the clients actually uh, use uh, more than two times per week. Uh, so they have more than 16 times in this eight week. And the other concern is that whether they would feel um, uncomfortable to share their paintings with others. The answer is that, well, uh, only 28% of them do not share any paintings with others. Uh, majority of the people actually uh, would share their paintings and it's more than one time as well. So looking at when they use the mobile app here is that you can find that it's a very interesting situation. Some people use it in the midnight. Uh, maybe I think it's the Hong Kong people who always get late sleep. And uh, but at the same time, um, they I think that it, that reflects the time that they are free from the caregiving tasks, caregiving duties. So that's why in the evening time they actually uh, use it quite often. Um, at the same time, we ask them to use it for eight weeks. Um, some of them actually continue to use the app after eight weeks as well. So you can see that they really like the app, even though that is more than eight weeks intervention. So uh, with this e-painting platform, we learned that uh, this is a very good way to let um, the general public to express their emotion and also is a way to reduce some of their uh, pressure. So um, now we have just got a funding from the Hong Kong government uh, to extend this work because last time I just have 28 people to have a small, small pilot study, uh, but now we have the funding to this uh, intervention could be now be extended to 800 caregivers uh, of different types of people and um, and in Hong Kong, and we will do this project in two years. Hopefully uh, after this, um, uh, the use of these 800 people, I think we can have more information about um, the efficacy of the app. OK, so uh, the third project is about using the app to help the caregivers. And again, we try to um, focus on uh, social support and connection. Uh, so I worked this out with um, uh, the, the colleagues in uh, Karolinski Institute in Sweden. Uh, this collaboration is that we work out the app for the Chinese, they work out for the Swedish people, uh, but it's the same platform uh, in the way that you can see that there are uh, all these features here in the app so as to allow people to build up their network uh, through the app. Uh, the good thing about having this is that when they have challenges, when they have difficulties in caregiving, they can communicate from others and learn from others. And this is one of the way to get health information as well. So you can see in the app that actually it allows people to have a caregiver to caregiver communication and also communication with the professionals. So by then the professionals can use the uh, chat box to announce some uh, useful information about caregiving to them and they could get the information through this app. And we also allow uh, the users uh, to um, get to get to know that where are the resources in the community. So uh, actually here, sorry, this is in Chinese, but just want to show to you that uh, we actually put up a resource list uh, the list of resources in the community here in the app so that they can feel free to approach other organizations when they need more information. Um, there's also a, um, a Q&A sections here so that at the back end, uh, the nurse and the social workers could uh, try to uh, reply some of the queries that the users have 
um, and try to give them some advice as well. So you can see that health information is uh, delivered through this technology, technological platform in a way that is on individual uh, needs basis. So um, it's not just a generic one, but it's really tailor-made for the individual needs. Uh, so I call this app as a SEMAT, uh, as a stress alleviating and monitoring system. Uh, we are trying to build this up, and I think that it's not, it should not be just an app, uh, but although the app is just a frontline platform, but at the back end, it's all about the connection, uh, the connection among the caregivers, also the connections of the caregivers with the professionals, as well as the researchers. Um, the researchers are here in this um, project has a very important role uh, to really find out what the caregivers really need uh, and Taylor made something for them. So um, with these three projects, basically I would conclude and say M Health technology is very helpful for us to enhance our health literacy. But and yes, there are some opportunities and challenges here. The good opportunities that you can see that using the technology, we can identify the high risk people uh, and then we can provide some instant advice to them. But at the same time, we can encourage the peers to be connected um, in the community and allow the professionals to reach out the general population. And it's quite cost effective in a way that one professional can reach out more uh, at one time. And I can see that um, electronic platform is no longer restricted to the young generation. Um, here in these three projects, all the users are middle-aged people and older people. Actually, they also welcome the M Health technology to get health information and make up their own decision. Uh, so you can see electronic means is very flexible in a way that they can use um, the platform at any time, anywhere, and at the time that when they are at ease. Um, I would suggest that we can have more collaboration in the future and we can do some cross country comparison in the future as well. Uh, so in terms of the challenges, I uh, I would suggest that uh, we have to look at uh, the involvement of the stakeholders. Uh, the stakeholders are not only patients, but also they are caregivers, um, the professionals, as well as the policy makers. The policy makers here in uh, the last three projects, uh, I haven't involved them yet, but I think that in the future, these people are very important because if they can buy in this concept, uh, knowing that mental health technology, uh, um, uh, M health technology uh, can be used as a means to promote health literacy, I think they will support and work out some policies or regulations uh, to, to, to upscale uh, all these projects. Um, for the challenges here, I think um, the biggest one is the technology part, that it takes time for us to, to develop uh, the technology. So that's why I think that um, once we de develop one technology, it should not be restricted to one small population. It should be extended to many, many populations um, so that uh, it, it is, uh, we are using our own, using the experience and try to tailor make the things for uh, different populations. Um, of course, M Health technology demands uh, the use of Wi-Fi, internet, and the use of the device as well, it may create some health disparity. But uh, having this uh, being recognized, I think that uh, we can do some things to um, narrow down this despair. Um, um, for the government, I think the government, as I mentioned, it they could help us a lot if they have some policy to support us. Um, Industry also can be another big party to support us as well. Uh, the, um, we actually like to see that different uh, disciplines work together, including nurses, doctors, um, uh, social workers, engineers, etc. Um, I think the efficacy of the technology uh, has to be further investigated and uh, more research to be done. Uh, by now, as uh, Professor Ryan mentioned that we have uh, the technology part. We may have used it, uh, but um, uh, the most important is that whether we would like to see this is good enough to change the people's uh, lifestyle and improve their health.
So I would conclude and say that yes, assistive technology has uh, has high potential to enhance health literacy um, by supporting people to make health decisions. Uh, but I think before they make the decision, they have to be well informed about uh, all the related information. They should be able to understand uh, the information and interpret it correctly. So uh, through the technology, we can help them to uh, achieve this area. But then the issue is that to use technology to enhance health literacy, we may need to think about all this issue. How to reach out to people in the community? Um, of course, we can have the media, but uh, how to do it? And how to support the people to use the technology? Who can support? And I think the most important is that uh, the cultural aspect. Um, lastly, I would conclude and say technology based health literacy programs uh, could be considered in the future and we can work collaboratively on this. Um, sorry, I, it seems that I have a little bit more time. Um, thank you. I'll stop here and stop to share. Yep. Thank you, ma'am, for ed educating us on enhancing health literacy to technology. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Usha Rani, Associate Professor and and the coordinator of Manipal Health Literacy Unit, Department of Social and Health Innovation, uh, Prasanna School of Public Health, as a moderator for panel discussion. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Spurti, uh, for introducing me, and thank you, uh, Professor Helmet Pran and Professor Angela, for your um, extraordinary and mind blowing talk. Thank you. And uh, uh, I really like the concept of uh, April Fool. Oh, thank you, Professor Helmet Bran, for bringing up the concept and uh, bringing up the concept of um, using your common sense. And um, here are two, uh, you know, different angles that we saw. One is going back to health literacy from 1.0 to health literacy 5.0, where now we have reached to the era where AI is going to give us 80% of information, and then we have to use our common sense which one to take and which one not to take. What about 20%? Thank you for that, Professor Brand. And Professor Angela talking about different applications as an interventions that would help maybe the mental health, um, um, upbringing the mental health of the people and uh, supporting the caregivers. Now, um, I would like to take this panel discussion a little forward and uh, we will restrict to maybe four or five minutes as we have overshoot the time. Um, a quick question. Now, since we are going to use um, common sense and we are also somewhere moving to digital and AI era, are we going to create a lot of health disparities and inequalities in the population? What is your call? And this question is to both of you, and I would like to start with Professor Angela because you are you're talking about digital health and the people who are extremes of population who do not have access to the digital health. So is there a threat to those population about health developing a health literacy? Uh, yeah, I think this is a big challenge. Uh, if some of the infrastructure is not good enough to support the technology part, and yet um, I think health literacy should not be just enhanced or promoted through technology. Um, I'm just proposing that technology is just a, a one of the means um, but health literacy, uh, I think the most important is that it is has to be addressing on the individuals and cultural situations as well. Uh, so that's why we can do it uh, in different means like verbal. Yeah, um, so only to a particular small population can get benefited with uh, digital uh, technology and AI. Um, uh, Professor Helmut Brand, what's your call on this? If we have to reach to the maximum population um, again, empowering their common sense, renaming health literacy to the health competencies. Is there a way out for us? Uh, regarding the inequality issue, the biggest inequality at the moment is age. Those who are 70 and older have not been raised with the use of uh, digital tools. So there is a biological situation, a solution to the problem uh, uh, of the major inequality, that is, when the younger generation has been raised up with using this, then there will be uh, uh, less inequality. Sounds a little bit uh, weird, but uh, in a way, what we saw, for example, is that to develop 
apps, for, for example, for, for diabetes care, you have always the direct user in mind. Perhaps you should talk to the relative of the user. So to the uh, daughter and son or the husband or wife of the diabetic uh, patient to do the work on the digital tool. So I think we have to, uh, uh, by, by, ad, ad, by uh, talking to the right people, I think we can solve uh, for the, this, this problem. And uh, when we see how, for example, India rolled out the infrastructure for digital tools and digital use, I think uh, uh, that uh, could be duplicated in other countries and uh, then this technological inequality will diminish too. I guess in three to four years we will not have a big uh, problem with this. We will have still a big problem with the knowledge of the people uh, because at the moment we see that people more and more because of the enormous variety of social media that are available that you stick to uh, the information you already like and um, this algorithm someone who liked this also like this is already driving you in one direction and what is really missing is that people are actively looking over uh, the borders left and right of their personal interest to get new information. So that's the reason why I think, for example, um, public information scan, uh, uh, channels uh, are very, very important uh, to provide people with neutral information about what's going on. Uh, and they have to be so attractive that people uh, use it. And um, having all information channels in the private hand is a problem. And of course, when it's state run, you have to see if this is neutral information too. But um, somehow we make it, have to make it happen that people not only uh, do communication in their own bubble. Thank you. Thank you so much for putting up the light on this. Uh, the next question for the panel is, um, uh, we were discussing about multi involvement of multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary team for uh, development of health literacy and moving away uh, not only from the survey to solutions. So is there a role of any multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary team to develop interventions for health literacy? And if so, what it is? Uh, over to you, Professor Brand, and then we will take insight from Professor Angela. Yes, information technology, sociologists, psychologists, they all should to come together. Health literacy is not um, a science in itself. It's just an application uh, where all the different specialities should work together. And for example, one trick for the scientific community would be a funding agency would say in a project at least four different specialities have to work together to in the application would increase the chances that we talk more to each other. At the moment, what I see when I'm a referee to proposals, it's mostly one sort of researcher. So the interdisciplinary mix is not given. And uh, we, if we talk to funding bodies and say, please ask that at least three or four different specialties have to be represented, we could increase this by a, a very simple way. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I totally agree that I think multidisciplinary collaboration would be very important to enhance uh, everybody's health literacy. I just give an example that uh, people who are very good in design, um, originally their work is to work out the project management and the design of the infrastructure like that. But from their training, they actually have a very good training in um, structurizing all the concepts and how to deliver the concepts in a, a very detailed way. So I think um, that one may not be the um, uh, something that uh, nurses or doctors know about that. So this gives us another insight to look at how message, health messages can be delivered in a systematic and a easy to find way in a structure uh, framework. So I, I think this is a good example to illustrate that people with different expertise can work together. I would call to say um, uh, it's not only health professionals who know the best, 
uh, yes, some people would think that, OK, doctors and nurses know more about health. But uh, when we talk about all this, I think psychologists, sociologists, um, even computer people may have an other angle uh, to help us to deliver the health message to the to the general public. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for um, bringing up a, a diverse, um, you know, spectrum of health literacy to this platform. Um, participants, your mic is now on and uh, yeah, the mic button is enabled and uh, I request if any one of you would like to ask any question to the panel, uh, you are most welcome. And for the group shoot, uh, group photo shoot, we would love to have your cameras on so that we can take one group photo of all of you in a together mode. Meanwhile, I request if anyone has any question, please to ask to the panel. Hi, Usha, this is Dr. Wari. I have a question. Oh, welcome you, sir, here. Yes, I, please. I just want to know what, what should be the level of education? It should be fifth grade, sixth grade, because the public is so variant in knowledge. So when you say all these big, big things to people, they don't understand. What should be the level of literacy? Fifth grade, sixth grade, third grade, because we always put out things that are very fancy in medical language. What should be the level of knowledge that we should be transmitting? At, at what level? To get my okay, question. Great. Sir, any specific panelists you want to ask, or it's open to both of them? Open to anybody, Dr. Helmer, oh. Dr. Angel. Yes. You may please um, ask. I can try to answer first. Yeah, according to the USA, they have a recommendations that uh, the left, the educational level should be like a primary four, primary four, or maybe grade, grade four uh, level. Uh, uh, that kind of level would be quite low in a way that um, uh, we encourage um, uh, the information to be delivered in a low level so that everybody can understand about that. Yeah, uh, but uh, whether these recommendations apply to all the countries. I really don't know. I think we need another exercise to test out uh, these recommendation grade four level uh, is too high or too low in different countries. Yeah. Okay, health literacy information. Thank you. Has to take in account uh, all strata of the society, regardless of the educational status. So, for example, in COVID times, we had the challenge to reach those people who are very low literate or even illiterate and uh, to uh, spread the news. And um, I think uh, that would not be needed for all and every interventions, but uh, I think we should keep uh, the information needed for essential uh, tasks uh, independent from the educational level. So there should be different version from information depending on um, uh, educational level available. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Warrior, for asking this question. Um, sir is from US and he's the professor for pediatrics. May I write, sir? Yes, I am. Thank yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any other question to the panel, please? You may unmute and you may ask. Actually, I have one more question. Is there no questions at all? Can I ask one more question? Yes, sir, please. What What about the, the, the who should take the leadership of medical school or university, individuals or, or a, a public organization? Who should be the people doing this? Because there are so many people involved. Could be a person, a university, a, a state health department. Who do you think should take the leadership? Well, um, I, before I worked at the university, I worked in public service and working in ministry and running Institute of Public Health. The driving force uh, in a way should be uh, the public service because from my personal per perspective, uh, because uh, the obligation of the public service of a country is to keep people healthy by different means. They should have the lead. For example, that's the reason why some countries have national action plans on health literacy, where they then define the different work packages 
that you can give to the different actors. And we have mostly four actors in a society. You have administration, government, academia, universities, uh, civil society, the NGOs, and industry. And if you do four work packages, who should do what? Then uh, um, you can build alliances and you monitor the, the progress. Uh, for example, most countries have a national TV station or national radio stations. It's much easier uh, to get this kind of neutral information transported via them than, dealing, uh, than having to deal with, for example, private TV and radio stations. On the other hand, um, universities have to provide the evidence on which then administration can uh, make decisions what kind of intervention should be there. Uh, industry, for example, has often the problem that they want to do something good, for example, for the workforce, but don't know what. So a health literacy survey for a company would unreveal what, where the problems are. Then you need a toolbox of what kind of health intervention would work. And then it, for this company setting, for example, you do an intervention and measure again with the survey. Uh, so that is the industry as recipient, and of course the industry as a provider could be in the developing, at the moment we will talk about health apps and so on. So I think all sectors of society will have dedicated works, but you need one coordinating uh, institution, and I would see this in the governmental level. Uh, Mickey, I can add a little bit more is that um, the government may play another important role as well. Uh, as far as I know, um, Taiwan has done a very good job there that um, they, they they have regulations for all the hospitals. If they want to get a license, they have to ensure that they uh, have literate organizations. So there's a regulations there that uh, that is binding uh, health literacy to their license so that um, the hospital administrators have to ensure all the procedures uh, are, are, are very good for everybody to even though they have low health literacy. Another example is that in Hong Kong, Hong Kong government actually uh, is doing a good job that uh, they are trying to educate people about health literacy and develop scale uh, across the board and so that we uh, are actually measuring every citizen's health literacy with the knowledge uh, of the levels of health literacy among the citizens, then more interventions can be created and supported by different parties in the society. 